All right, so good morning and welcome the first day of September. We're going to start having Christmas stuff up soon. I'm Professor Jennifer Harris and Howard. I'm going to get right into our exam three review. I do have a class right after this. Um, and so we'll we'll make sure that we we cover everything. Let me share. All right. So of course, with all reviews, it's not all encompassing. You want to do everything that we've already talked to you guys about. Make sure you do your readings and all of that. So let me. I've got this zoom bar over where I need to go. Slideshow. From the beginning, there we go. We're gonna get this, we're gonna get this. This is short, sweet, and to the point, but I think it's, um, I think it's pretty good. You are gonna likely see math. Math is always gonna be there to so make sure that you feel comfortable there. All right. Getting right to it. Okay, you guys, my first slide covers community assessment. Think of your community assessment as your, your head to toe. Before you go into the room, you should have already reviewed the chart, maybe, well, not maybe, review diagnosis and that sort of thing. So community assessment involves gathering information on the community so that you have an idea of what things that you need to focus on and, can, and you know, you're gonna work together with your community. So think of it, if you wanna think of it as your head to toe, that's a good place to start. So this is gathering data from various sources. You wanna look at birth certificates, not birth certificates, Jesus. You wanna look at um, local data, or you can look at the health department, look at the, the age, race, distribution, those sort of things. Look at death, what, you know, top death rates, what's affecting those folks on majority people dying from um, drug addiction or pneumonia or that sort of thing. You want to know things as far as, you know, what type of education. Um, almost think of it like a census data. When you fill that out, they want to, you want to know what's the, um, how many people have completed college, high school, that sort of thing, religion, politics, all of that information. And you're also going to do things like you may do a windshield survey. I think you guys have that coming up. You want to drive around and get a comfortable with what's, what's available, supermarkets, that sort of stuff. You know, is there a hospital, fire departments, libraries? It seems like a lot it is, but you're going to do this over a period of time before you even begin to launch any type of project. You need to know what you're dealing with. So this is not something you do overnight. Just keep that in mind. When you say a community assessment, which again is different from the floor because you gotta get ready for clinical the next day. This is a whole bunch of people that you'll be taking care of as one community. So you wanna take your time and get all of this. Think of this as a giant case study, if that makes you, makes, Makes you feeling better. When I did my community assessment on the reservation, I think probably three, four months because we actually did the next thing. We went door to door. So we gathered data, data from the community. We were asking questions. That's the last one. You want to figure out their values, their beliefs, because your values, beliefs, your social norms plays a part in how you see health, especially if you're working with like uh, an indigenous community where they may value things this way and believe things that way. You want to know everything here. And you will you guys will get copies of this slide. I'll make uh, this presentation. We always send it out to the other professors. But this is, that you take your time with this, all right? You collect, just like that screen says, that picture, you want to collect data, analyze data, develop a report. You want to present that information to folks. You don't want to go into community collect all this information about them and not tell them about themselves. And then you form groups with the community and like, okay, this is what I've found. What should we work, what should we work on first? Because you don't leave them in the community, they do. Because you want to make everybody healthy and happy as possible. They may, they may think they need a walking path. 
you may say, you know, there's not a fire department within X miles. Maybe we can work with the local fire department to have like a little small branch. All right. You get that. That's just that slide. All right. And then this kind of goes along. What goes along with it is that you want to, you can't do everything by yourself. So there's different organizations, so organizations like um, uh, local leaders. You want to involve as many people that not necessarily let live there and work there and play there. You want to involve local Is she frozen? Is it me or? No, it's not you. I can't she, hear her. She, she frozen. Oh, okay. To show interest in the community. If you, oh, Miss Teresa, can you mute? You were frozen, Professor. We you couldn't hear you. went out. I went out? Yep. For a good little bit. Let me go back. Let me go back on community partnership. Did we talk about that? You went out. Let me go back over. All right. You guys got me now? Yes. Okay. All right. So what I was saying was community partnership is that you're not going to be able to do, you, you don't, you can't do everything by yourself and you want to involve people in the community that not that live there, but also work there. These businesses that have been there for years and they know the community like the back of their hand, organizations, faith-based groups, individual people. So you have a group of, I mean, it doesn't have to be a whole bunch, five or six people besides yourself that are seen as leaders in the community to help you with the project. And that's what it means. But you want folks that are not just complaining and moaning, you know, because let me get a part of this because people keep raiding my store. You want folks that are actively involved in the community that want to see it do better as well. And then moving on to violence and human abuse. So your violence and human abuse is your chapter 27. So chapter 27 deals with... Um, violence from different angles. So not only does it look at um, the fact that people of color, youth, low income, those who are vulnerable tend to have the highest case cause of death and disability associated, associated with violence. So if you're working in communities where you have low income, people of color, those are things you wanna make sure you screen for because Believe it or not, you, you think physical like, oh, you know, they have a high rate of asthma or this, that, the other. But keep keep violence and human abuse in the back of your mind whenever you're working with folks um, that are socio socioeconomically, you know, disproportionately affected by other things. Just keep that in your mind and, and screen for it. So then when you're dealing with interpersonal violence, you're looking at community violence within the community. So let's say the, the easiest one for there would be like gangs and um, you know conflicting people in different uh, parts of the neighborhood, this person don't like this person on this neighborhood or this that sort of thing. So there there is violence in the community. You wanna make sure, you wanna make sure you're as a community health nurse, just like when, we're on the floor when we ask about violence. You want to keep that in your mind. It's all that's the saying. There's sexual violence, of course, we're aware of that. You want to make sure you screen. Even if folks are partnered up, you want to ask those questions. Um, what's important to remember is that anytime someone has a history of abuse, it doesn't matter race, color, creed, that is a high indicator of continued abuse. So you want to ask about a history of abuse, previous reported abuse. Um, it's important to remember. Unfortunately, that tends to lead to more 
They do it once, they may do it again sort of thing. And then intimate partner violence, harm caused by your current or former spouse or partner. So just make sure you ask for it. If that lady or that guy tells you that this has happened before, then again, previous reported history of abuse is, is indicative of future abuse. I want to just keep that in mind. I know this looks gross, but this is actually two mouths and a whole bunch of germs coming out of them. Hope y'all had breakfast. So then we're going to go into <clears throat> infectious disease. Okay. All right. Just double checking my chat. Hopefully I'm on unfrozen. Infectious disease prevention and control. So your infectious disease prevention and control, that's your chapter 11. So in a nutshell, majority of infections, not all of them, are preventable. And so as public health, community health people, we live, we love that primary prevention, especially when it comes to infectious stuff. Because there's no, we know there's a lot of teaching that we could be doing, a lot of education, a lot of vaccines. That's why you get your vaccines so you can prevent a disease from happening, such as the flu or shingles or pertussis. And so of all of the different things that we've learned as far as infectious disease is concerned, it's primary all day. That's where we wanna stay. We don't ever wanna see another outbreak ever. So then preventing and controlling disease, education, education, do this, don't do that. Wash your hands, stay home when you're sick, get your vaccines, this, that, and the other. And then what's important for you guys to remember is that, you know, we all, if you have kids, had kids, nieces and nephews, we all know about, you know, nobody has an issue with vaccines when it comes with kids because they go in for their well child, they do this and that. But what I want you guys to do when you look at the scenarios is that I want you to think outside the childhood recommendations, because as adults, we, there's vaccines everybody is recommended for based on at the, you know, after, for example, CDC recommends everyone over six months gets their annual flu vaccine. Well, then that's everybody in the world, unless you're five months old, but not, I don't want you guys to think flu vaccine, but just, I want you to, when you look at the scenarios, think beyond the children's, think adults and think there's things that we need at certain ages. Like I'm in my fifties. I just got the shingles not too long ago. I went ahead and just got it done. I think it was worse than the um, tetanus as far as my arm sore. It was not as worse as COVID arm sore, but it was it was up there. So I, got, I went ahead and got my shingles. So just know that there, there are things that are recommended based on age, sex. I mean, not age, based on age and um, your, your health and that sort of thing. All right. And then when you're looking at secondary screenings, when you guys look at your, um, when you, first of all, when you go into the exams, put on your public health community health hat. I want you to think you're that person. When you're going to sec, when you're looking at secondary, as far as infectious disease is concerned, what I want you guys to remember are the, again, those three S's, screening, surveys, and surveillance. Secondary involves screening for something, surveys or surveillance. And we'll I think we're gonna talk about surveillance in my class today. Um, you're not diagnosing anything. You can't diagnose because we're nurses, all right? You can do blood pressure. Blood pressure is a type of screen. Um, placing a PPD is a type of screening. If the PPD is positive, it means they have a positive screening, but we cannot diagnose a positive. No healthcare provider. I'm a nurse practitioner. No health, I'm not going to diagnose you. I'm going to have a positive PPD all day, every day. I converted back in 1995 when I worked on a respiratory floor and we had homeless folks with TB, not like homeless and TB go together. And so I reacted like within a year of working on that floor so no more skin tests for me in 20 some years. So if you put a PPD on me, it will get as big as my head. 
And so I do not have TB. So just know that your secondaries are S's. And so when you're looking at these scenarios and they're asking you, is this primary, if this is secondary, is tertiary, I want you to look at the action that's being performed because all of these different preventions are action focused. Look at the act that's being done. If she's placing a PPD, she is performing a screening. And so don't look at all the other stuff around it trying to throw you off. And I think these questions are pretty straightforward. Just pick out the key word. If she's asking you if which one's secondary, you're going to look at something that involves a screening. Are they screening for something? Which one is involved screening? Which one involves some type of survey? Like when you go in in the doctor's office, when the past six months have you felt like this and that? And then surveillance, just to touch on a, a little bit, surveillance is, is you actively are looking at cases when you... This is think CDC declaring an outbreak because it's you know certain amount of numbers of Ebola have arose. Um, surveillance is you just keeping an eye on the fact that in your community you guys had two protests this year and last uh, last year and this year you got ten, and you're calling the health department like what should we do? So it's the action. In tertiary, again, some people get tripped up with it, is that you have a diagnosis. So high blood hypertension, obesity, asthma, diabetes. You can have a group of people that are dying of cancer and you can educate them about eating fiber, but they still have cancer. So then you wanna look at the action and you wanna look and see if there's a diagnosis. So if you have a group of people that have diabetes, they still have diabetes, performing the action at the diagnosis. So look at what they're doing and look and see if there's a diagnosis involved. Somebody, and it's not going to be gray. It's going to be obesity, drug addiction, those sort of things, you have it. And so anything you do after the fact, because you're not never going to give up on people and say you have, you know, you're addicted to meth. I'm not going to give you a flu shot. You're going to give them a flu shot because CDC recommends it. So you look at the action, you look and see if there's a disease involved. Okay. And then ethics is your chapter six. So ethics is... A lot of these these terms you're just gonna have to memorize, and I'm gonna go through them. But you know, ethics and and public health, when that's concerned, you're looking at trying to do the best good for a whole bunch of people. And there's different theories involved, and so your action might be ut utilitarian focus, deontology focus, principalism, virtue, and feminist. And so I'm just gonna just go through it. But at the end of the day, you want to make sure you understand the differences in this definition. And again, make it make sense to you. So utilitarianism is, th this is an action that someone does that they're trying to do the greatest good for as many people as possible. And the perfect example where they were saying that during COVID, where they were like, everybody has to be home at a certain time. Everybody needs a vaccine. Everybody needs this. Everybody needs that. And I want to get into the laws, but there are certain things that the, you know, I don't want to say the government, what well, can do because they're trying to protect people. You don't have to like it, but they're trying to protect as many people because again, go back and look at this slide. The end justifies the means. So if you want to think of it as being a parent when you're like, I want all the kids to do this and, you know, they don't like it. I'm like, I'm just trying to keep you safe and healthy. So that's utilitarianism. You, the action you do, you're trying to do the, have the greatest good for as many people as possible because, you know, in the end, it's going to be for the, for the better, for the good. And then deontology is focused on right or wrong of an action. And so it looks at um, the right or wrong of the action versus the right or wrong of the consequence. And an example of this probably would be 
Um, it is right. So there's a whole bunch of people and one of those people is the president. And so um, you have to, a duty, I guess, mm, for me, I would look at the duty to do the right thing. Whichever part of this makes sense to you to kind of remember, that's fine. But you have a duty to to save the president life and let millions of people die because you got to have a president. It is so it's more of duty focused. You know, you have a duty as a parent to do this, um, regardless of um, the consequence. So think of if if you want to think of deontology as duty focused, then pull that word out of it, deontology duty focused. But again, go back and have it make sense to you. But that's how I would remember it. And principalism, principalism, did I say that right? So these are a set of principles that guide healthcare Benef benefits, beneficence. You're going to do the right thing. You're not going to cause any harm, non-maleficent. You're going to autonomy. Folks have a decision to make their own choice, regardless of what you think. If she decides she's done with dialysis, she's done with chemo, that is her right to do. That's autonomy and justice. It's just justice, you know, making sure that folks um, have a voice and making sure that folks um, that you're doing, you're, you're giving people the choice to make their decisions. You're not causing any harm and um, you're you're being an advocate for them. So these are the these are the four principles, beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy and justice. So. So that's principalism. Again, these are all ethics, okay? And then feminist ethics, most people, when they think of feminists, they think of, you know, women's rights. And it's, it's still the case, but um, it's expanded also to, we wanna make sure people have the right to vote and have access to health care. And so when you're thinking of um, feminists, it's women and others. So it's like, yeah, back in the 60s, it's like women need the right to vote or 50s and whenever that happens. Now we're like, okay, we got our right to vote. Let's keep going with it. So it's it's also making sure that every, everybody has the right to vote and everybody has access to health care. Just go back and make sure for these definitions, you understand the difference. And some things you just gonna have to memorize so if you see it again, you can pick it out. All right. Oh, hang on. Somebody's trying to get admitted. What happened to my slideshow? I'm just making sure we have one, two, I thought we had more people. Okay. All right. I'm just going to keep going. Hang on, you guys. I'm trying to move this to where I can see. So then <clears throat> these cultures or Native Americans, Hispanics, immigrants, and refugees, these are four different cultures and ethnicities that you just want to make sure that you understand that, for example, Native Americans are past-oriented. They're not concerned about the future. So as a community health nurse, I, I work on the reservation. So I already know that, um, yeah, we may go ahead and make that appointment for them, but a lot of times, especially when you get to know your 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 clients, and that's what it's all about. I know that we're gonna have to call them the same day. Some of my folks I already know. It may seem like hand holding, but again, when you make that future appointment and, and they don't show up, they're not concerned with the future, they're concerned with the present. So then sometimes you have to just as long as you know that, you may have to do have your MA or someone call them. And then we talked about in my class, Hispanics, that, you know, of course, you want to be polite with everyone else. 
with everybody. But you want to, they like direct eye contact. Some cultures do not like you to look them straight in the eyeball. They want you to sit down and, and converse with them first before you even like begin to touch them. And then physical contact is good with them. Again, know your culture because some people, you're not supposed to look them in the eye. You're not supposed to touch them. But know that if you should see, you, you want to know if you should see these on an exam, what's important. And then immigrants, all right? So immigrants, folks that come over to the country, you can expect the language barrier. You can expect that their religion, of course, their religion may be different from your own, social and monetary. And so, again, if you're dealing, if you're working with a large immigrant population, you already know that you want to have someone, if possible. You don't have to memorize this, but have someone. You want to address all of these. So, if there's a language barrier, you need someone. First of all, if there's someone that's native that lives lives there that, that can translate, a uh, family member that can translate. And all of these things can impact their health as well. So you're going to get a whole bunch of folks involved, but just know that you want to make sure that um, all of these different things that can impact their he health is addressed. And I know it seems like a lot, but it may be culturally, you know, that the culture may be that they... Um, they don't take this kind of medication or they don't do blood transfusion. You just want to know. All of this is about knowledge. So you can go in and, and do the best community health work you can. And then what's for refugees, what's really, really, really important for you guys to, to remember about this slide is that a refugee is different from an immigrant. An immigrant, you know, they, they volunteer, they come over, you know, they come over, they want to come over. Refugees, you kind of think of them, they're usually fleeing a conflict, a disaster, a horrific event, torture, warfare. They're not going to be in the best state of mind. Well, a lot of folks may not be in the best state of mind, but you, I want you to guys remember for test purposes is that there's also, there's oftentimes trauma involved and you want to get folks connected to therapy and social services. All right. Yeah, you're going to do all the physical stuff. But with refugees, and that's different from the Native American and Hispanics, is that there's an active mental, a likely mental health component with it. And you don't want to ignore that while you're dressing their bandages and what have you. So you want to get folks the social services that they need. All right. And there we go. Moving this thing around. All right, and then case management. Let me put this over here. Okay, so with with case management, these are this is another type of specialized um, nursing, and that circle is really really good to remember because it kind of flows with everything. So this nurse case manager, and you can be a yeah, you have your nurse case managers in the hospital. You can have them at, they can work in different locations or what have you. But what's important is that like in that circle is your, let's say your nurse case manager, and then she's doing all of that. And so you're coordinating the care and making sure it's not the same as home health because, you know, your home health nurse is going out to the home. She's doing these orders and dressings and stuff. You're like the gatekeeper. And you're you're the person that's getting them to the community resources, getting making sure that folks are connected. There are different doctors, you know, are connected with each other. You're developing a care plan or a case plan or what have you. It's individualized. So if you have um, if you have a client with end stage renal disease. You're going to get a list of their providers together. You're going to start finding out their appointments. You're going to make sure that they that every member of the team, you might do like a case call, making sure everybody gets together with the family, go over some things. And so you're always continually making sure that nothing is nothing is, is left behind. Nothing is not done. What I want you guys to remember for this slide is with all things, is that not only are you the patient advocate, but what's important is that I want you to think about safety. 
all right? Safety first, making sure the client is safe. So you wouldn't want someone that um, is on hospice to be home alone. And I know that sounds silly um, or not being attended to. So you, you're advocating for that. Well, they're fine. You know, they're dying. They've, they got oxygen. I turned her over and I went to the grocery store or something. No, 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 no. So safety first and remember your, your ABCs and you should be fine with any case management questions. And then disaster management. Disaster management is your, that's your chapter. Just give me a second. That's your chapter 16. So your disaster management, nurses, community health nurses, yeah, you now you see why I specialize. We're involved in everything. Disaster management, a case, uh, a community health, public health nurse would have been, this past weekend in Florida, she would have been busy. She would have been busy. She's probably still busy. She's probably still busy. So not to be funny, but know the difference between natural and man-made. Natural means there's nothing you can do to stop it. You cannot move the panhandle and get out of the way of the hurricane. Earthquakes, hurricanes, epidemics. Man-made is something you did. You started that forest fire. You contaminated the water, uh, warfare, that sort of thing. And so I am going to use the past event in Florida, my home state, as an example. Primary you sh we should have already, we know when, it's a little early, I think, but still, we know when hurricane season is. Back where I, and I'm at the Panhandle, but like, I would think in Miami and that type of area, you guys, are, you know, when hurricane season, we used to have, be prepared. We had our, we had our canned goods, we had our generator, we had things. So as a community health nurse, all right, you want to, yeah, education. You want education and preparation. Think of those because, again, I would think hurricane season, if she's covering an area, I'm just making it up something. She's covering an area where she knows she has like a, uh, a bunch of nursing homes or this, that, and the other, or, or clients that are vulnerable. Um, several of our clients um, have elderly on oxygen. She's getting, she's getting them prepared, all right? That's... So that's primary. Again, it's always education and preparation at primary, all right? Because you're not going to prevent the hurricane, but you can get ready. All right. Why is my hand up? Put my hand down. I don't know what happened. And then... And then secondary, secondary, of course, are your, your screenings. And you're probably like, screen for what? But then again, you're going around to you're you're going around to your different homes. You're you're screening them. You're you're trying to make sure that folks have their medication. They they have a list of things that they need. You're doing surveillance as well. You're monitor, yeah, you're monitoring the storm. You're trying to make sure that people have things boarded up and ready to go. And then tertiary would be is hit. You've gotten folks, you know, already to the shelters. You're assessing damage. You're looking at any type of disability and injury and getting your folks, you know, connected to the resources, social services if they need it, housing, all that. So that's like recovery after the after the storm and then now we're gonna go and i can't even okay outbreak investigation this little zoom thing is over part of my slide so i'm like what is that one outbreak investigation all right so your public health surveillance and outbreak investigation is your chapter 17 so surveillance is Secondary. So public health surveillance is a secondary action. 
There's passive surveillance and then there's active surveillance. So passive surveillance means that if you're having cases of positive PPDs and skin tests, you're reporting them. And that's how people get their numbers and start declaring stuff. So like you're, 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 we have to report our cases of HIV. We have to report our cases of syphilis. We have to report paperwork, 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 paperwork. But somebody somewhere in some health department, they have to take these numbers and do stuff with them. All right. Active is when you're going around, knocking on doors, actively talking to somebody, gathering information, doing case findings, that sort of thing. And so the whole point is that you're collecting data you're analyzing, you're interpreting data, you're getting numbers. This is this is epi all day because that's how folks get numbers and declare outbreaks and determine that this section of town has more folks with this, that, or the other. Um, so at your role as community health nurse, okay, is you're, you're, you're obtaining this information and you're knowing, you already know because you've already done your community assessment that you had, I'll just say, two people with asthma. And you can surveillance anything. Now you have 30 people with asthma. I, so with that information, you're going to start taking action if that makes sense. But just know just know the difference between passive, passive and active. Passive is actually you're reporting stuff. I, I'm going to go back to my class when we did that outbreak investigation with the kids at the summer camp. She reported all of those things to the health department. That's why they started doing stuff. Um, surveillance is same as observation with the goal of reducing morbidity and mortality by preventing and controlling disease. And all that means is that you're not just gathering data for data sake. You're trying to be proactive. You're not going to wait until people start falling out in the street from Ebola. You're going to start, you're going to take that information and you're going to do something about it so that people, morbidity means death. I mean, morbidity means, I'm sorry, like disability. Mortality, of course, is death. You're trying to prevent all this. So you're not getting these numbers and just sitting around drinking coffee. You're trying to be, it's like, you're always are like, almost like not wanting the next outbreak, but you're just like, okay, if I get one more case on my desk, you want to do something about it. And then again, point source, outbreak, point source, intermittent, mixed outbreak, and propagated outcomes. You just want to know these definitions. Point source is you're, there's somebody with a disease, they're the point, and everybody that gets in contact with that individual ends up with the outbreak, ends up with the disease, okay? I'm going to explain this in, in my terms, but you just you just want to make sure this is another one you're just going to have to go back and just memorize. I'm gonna be honest with you. This is still your this is still your chapter 17. Intermittent outbreaks means exactly that. Somebody may be exposed, but the the out the the people that get ex, that get affected by it is intermittent, if that makes sense. So it's kind of hard for you to pinpoint where it's coming from. And a lot of this stuff you don't find out until you do your, your investigations, trying to figure out the source, but because the outbreaks, the the cases are happening, people are getting affected so sporadically that you're trying to figure out, because all of this is, all of this is still epi stuff and you're doing outbreak investigations. So this is all part of your, these are different, these are different things that's involved in an outbreak investigation. And so there are terms to remember. And then I think of mixed out, I think of mixed outbreak is that, okay, you declare an outbreak in one area and then 
you get it contained and you're like, okay, we got this. And then there's an outbreak in a completely different section of your neighborhood. But you don't find out until you do investigation, the investigation is really part of the same thing. This is how I understand it. But again, go back. All right. And then propagated outcomes, propagated outcomes have to do with the um, the result of the outbreak, if that makes sense at all. And as far as you're you're looking at the, you're always are looking at the source and you're gathering information about that source. And you're trying to find out how these folks have gotten how it all ties together. I know it sounds like a bunch of wishy-washy, but again, go back and just make sure it makes sense to you because you're going to want to understand it. And I I need to move along. <laughs> okay, so quality improvement. Quality improvement is a continuous process, okay? We all want to make sure that the, the health care we provide to our folks is good. And so it was a never ending, never ending thing that we do. And there's, I have nurses that they work in the quality improvement, QI department is what they call it. You always want to make sure that you, you involve your staff. Okay. You want to make sure that your program that you develop, you have these things, you have goals, objectives. What's our philosophy? This is what we're trying to reduce fall preventions. This is your part. This is your role in it. These are our standards. And then quality assurance, the differences, and this is your, uh, I think this is your chapter 19, if I'm not mistaken. And so quality assurance is that you just, it's just what everybody has a, a level of performance that they're supposed to provide to their patients. We're all accountable for our own work, okay? Yes, teamwork involved. And, you know, if there's a problem come up, you want to fix it, but you know, you have a role in it and every patient you care for, you need, you're responsible for your own self. And that if you think of the patient as, as your clients and you want to keep your clients happy and coming back and healthy, then that will help you. And then healthcare learning, we all, everybody learns differently. All right. We all know that from being in this class and being in other classes as community health nurse, you're not going to get all this right off the jump. When I go out to the high schools, I know they like to, I, I know after about 10 minutes, I've lost them. So I do a lot of, I don't want to say games, like they're, well, they are kids. So you just got to figure out your target. You got to know your target audience first. So that's important. Cognitive, I'm a cognitive learner. I think too much. I analyze too much. I memorize. I just, I like, I like to reason things. I have to that's why I keep saying the same thing over together. I have to analyze it. And when it makes sense to me, then I'm got it. You can't, you can't trip me up with any scenario. But you may not be a cognitive. You might be effective, which means you know, you you look at the how you feel. And there's nothing wrong with that. How you feel and your values. You got to figure out your learning pattern. And then some folks are they they perform a skill. Once they do that fully, all that other stuff that people talked about in the books, then it makes sense. So some people are like, I got to do it. You can tell me about it, but once I do it, I'll, I'll get it and all of that. So just know, know your target audience. And with that, you guys, if you don't study, you shall not pass. So you got to study and do your part. And with that, you guys, I am going to officially stop recording. I am Professor Jennifer Harrison Howard. Good luck on exam three.